different components of frailty, as I believe the background and um, kind of components of frailty are a good way to look at what we need to address to overcome frailty and to be able to lead our patients to age successfully. I want you to be able to understand some of the screening tools and objective measures that we use to identify at-risk populations for frailty. I want you to understand the general activity and nutritional recommendations for the older adult. And finally, I want you to understand tools to increase compliance with exercise and nutritional interventions so that we can actually help our patients and individuals make those actual changes that are going to change their life. So first, let's define successful aging. The definition of successful aging includes three key behaviors or characteristics that should be perpetuated as long as possible. So these include a low risk of disease and disease-related disabilities, high mental and physical functioning, and finally, active engagement with life. Um, especially that third one, that active engagement with life, um, that really helps a patient develop that subjective well-being, which we're going to talk about. So not only the biomedical um, aspects of um, activity and nutrition to uh, minimize that risk of disease and disability and maintain uh, that high function, but also being able to use that function to engage with life and in activities that actually um, make their life very rewarding or what we call optimally subjective well-being, okay? So first, I think it would be productive to just define frailty. So frailty is a clinically recognizable state of increased vulnerability resulting from aging-associated decline in reserve and function across multiple physiologic systems such that the ability to cope with everyday or acute stressors is compromised. So as you can see in this diagram, which I think is helpful, on the far left, on the y-axis, we have functional capacity rated from 0% to 100%. And then we have on the x-axis, chronological aging from arbitrary zero to advanced age. You can see on um, when a patient is very young on the chronicle aging on the x-axis, their functional reserve is very high. So when you're youthful, you have a lot of things uh, working in your favor, meaning that you can have slight things happen to you, but you still have a large reserve of functional, uh, functional reserve. So you may get sick, but a child who gets sick doesn't get into the point where they're frail and unable to walk or unable to care for themselves. So as you see with normal aging process, we are going to see slight declines just from physiological changes that, that do happen over time. Now we are going to talk about different ways we can attenuate those changes. However, we do expect a normal decline over time. Um, but what you can see with accelerated aging um, is that we're going to have that loss of independence going from independent to frail um, much uh, closer in the chronological um, age bracket. So you're, you're, we see patients who are falling into that frail category um, much more quickly and then again into disab the disabled category much more quickly and earlier in their lifespan than they would um, someone who's aging normally. So we're going to talk about some of the things, um, some of the definitions of uh, the cycle of frailty um, and kind of the operational definitions of frailty, ways we can test for frailty, and then finally how we combat uh, some of these comprised energetics and actually keep our patients from becoming frail uh, in an overall kind of picture of wellness. So this is a diagram that we are going to revisit throughout this talk. This is a great diagram of kind of the cycle of frailty because all of these things are very interrelated and I really want that to be a major takeaway that you take um, from this presentation is that all these different um, aspects that we're going to talk about, weight loss, decreased activity, decreased walking speed, strength, 
uh, sarcopenia, which we'll define and talk about, undernutrition, falls, all these things happen because they're all interrelated. And when we have kind of one domino fall, we tend to have several dominoes fall as well. So we're going to talk about um, the different aspects of this and then how we can actually attenuate this process. So in the absence of a kind of a gold standard, frailty has largely been defined as um, meeting three of the following criteria, which are largely just talking about comprised energetics. So what we see is the five different criteria are low grip strength, low energy, slowed walking speed, low physical activity, and unintentional weight loss. And again, to be functionally defined as frail, you have to meet at least three of those. But we're going to talk about how they're so interwoven together, as you can see in the diagram. Oftentimes, when a patient meets one, it's going to cause you to meet several others. That's why they are really a good proxy for how a patient is actually doing. So again, back to the energetics, you know, uh, Schrat et al. really proposed that maybe um, frailty is just really deteriorating function is, is just all about energy. So with increasing age, um, energy availability overall declines. And then energy needs actually can increase because a patient has become weaker. And we're going to talk about kind of that uh, role of sarcopenia, uh, loss of muscle, lean muscle mass, poor, inadequate nutrition, how that all kind of plays into this. So these patients have less energy reserve available to go beyond kind of that whatever is necessary just for maintaining homeostatic equilibrium because they're not taking in enough energy and because they're becoming deconditioned by not actually moving or being physically active. On top of that, losing uh, muscle mass. So this really supports the notion that slowed gait speed and decline in physical activity may actually be adaptive responses to conserve energy expenditure. So again, in that kind of cycle, um, the body's just trying to maintain homeostasis. So at some point, if a person is not taking in adequate nutrition, um, their body is telling them to slow down, not to waste energy, because you don't want to waste away. So your body is kind of down-regulating your energy expenditure. Well, then that down-regulation and in energy expenditure means a patient isn't moving as much, which means they become more deconditioned. And again, that cycle kind of continues. That is why slowed gait is a big predictor of frailty and mortality. So next we're going to go through those five different um, aspects of frailty and talk about them a little bit uh, more independently. So the first one is low grip strength. So that reduced muscle strength as measured with grip as a proxy for overall muscle strength has been highly associated with increased risk of all-cause mortality as well as cardiovascular mortality. That's why grip strength is such a quick simple and inexpensive means to actually determine a person's risk for cardiovascular death and overall mortality. Also, weak uh, hand grip later in life is also a risk factor for disability. You think about all the different things a patient has to do with a strong grip strength as far as carrying items, pr um, practicing different ADLs, cooking for themselves, lifting things. Um, that's why it's such a has a, such a big carryover. It's also an independent risk factor for morbidity, mortality, and it really is central to the definitions of sarcopenia and frailty, like we're going to discuss. So that's the first aspect. The second one we talked about on that diagram was fatigue. Fatigue is really one of the most common reasons given by community dwelling older people for activity restriction, and it is frequently reported as the cause of disability. So again, when we talk about fatigue, those people are deconditioned. They're not going out as much. And when they're not going out as much, they become more deconditioned and more fatigued. Again, we talk about all those energetic issues. So they're not taking in enough nutrition. All this kind of feeds into these same pathways. 
So prevalence studies suggest the rate of self-reported fatigue among older people is quite high. So 25% of all individuals, older individuals in primary care, and up to 98% in long-term care are reporting significant fatigue. So how it was originally determined by Fred et al., who was the one who labeled those five criteria, they actually measured for fatigue just by um, asking a few questions. These questions were pulled from uh, the Center for Epidemiological Studies Dis uh, Depression Scale. So there are actually two questions about um, fatigue pulled from a depression scale. So the participants were each asked how often in the last week they felt that everything they did was an effort. And the second question was how often in the last week could they just not get going? So they tested positive for fatigue if they answered either moderate or most of the time during the past week for either or both of those above questions. Again, these are very uh, easy questions to ask and easy questions that you can work into a subjective examination as a physical therapist in order to really determine if a patient is um, experiencing fatigue. So these are two good questions that we can definitely pull away and put into use. One of the biggest things I think we should take away from this is a slowed walking speed, kind of the third indicator. So walking speed is really a massive indicator of mobility in general, which makes sense. High specificity of walking as um, most people's means of actual mobility. This is a great diagram on the right on what walking speeds are actually needed um, to, to um, or how they match up to different functional levels. So we're really going to talk about um, 0.8 meters per second is usually the cutoff for a couple different things. So that's the cutoff for frailty um, as defined by the four meter walk test. We're going to discuss the walk test on the next slide here. Um, it's also a component of for diagnosing someone with sarcopenia, which we, again, sarcopenia is something we'll address a little bit later as well. So really remembering 0.8 meters per second is a pretty good cutoff, meaning these patients are starting to, to really not be very successful uh, with walking or mobility. As you can see, you really need to be at least one meter per second for kind of being independent with ADLs. So that's another pretty good cutoff that a lot of our goals we should be writing for our patients should really be based around about one meter per second walking speed, while normal walking speed is all the way up to 1.2 to 1.3. Okay, again, as you see uh, on the very bottom of that diagram, 0.8 is the cutoff for a community ambulator. Again, so uh, well, one of the big takeaways I like people to know is when you are um, doing walking speed, really that 0.8 and 1.0 are two big numbers uh, to remember. When you're dipping below that, we're really getting into patients who aren't being very successful with mobility or walking. Again, when you get down to 0.6, the, the rate or risk for hospitalization is very high, the, risk, the fall risk is getting higher, and these patients are usually dependent in their ADLs and IADLs, okay? So when we're actually performing our gait assessments, um, the distance of our gait assessments can be anywhere from three to 10 meters. It is very important though that we give at least two meters for acceleration and two meters for deceleration. That way that gait speed is even as uh, um, across the measured distance. We also need to be very comfortable and capable of making sure that we measure over the same distances for both the quick walk and the comfortable walk. So typically we're gonna measure our patients walking at a normal natural speed. We'll usually measure that twice and average that and then we'll also ask our patients to walk as quickly as they can without running over that same distance. That's going to be our max walking speed. We're going to have them do that twice as well and then average that. Our fourth aspect of frailty we want to examine is low physical activity. And I've already mentioned that 
quite a few times when I'm talking about the other systems. So when I was talking about um, reports of fatigue, um, decreased um, uh, walking speed, all these things are kind of, again, part of that cycle. They're all very interrelated. So when a patient is more fatigued, then they don't do as much. They don't do as much activity. And that fatigue and low activity might be because of undernutrition or overall weight loss, which we're gonna talk about as well. So what we know is that participation in regular physical activity is associated with around a 40% lower risk of experiencing low energy or fatigue. So that's what it's really gonna come back to is these patients are very deconditioned. What we do know, if we can get these patients to engage in regular exercise, we can decrease their fatigue and we can increase their ability for physical activity. Um, again, when we are talking about uh, fatigue and reduced activity, they're so interrelated, it is really hard to determine if fatigue is causing reduced activity or the reduced activity is causing fatigue because again, they're so interrelated. Again, we'll go back to that first diagram just to see just how interrelated these systems are. So let's revisit this once again. So that decreased activity, as you can see on the left, means that we're gonna have maybe a decreased maintenance of that lean tissue. So we're gonna have weight loss, we're gonna have sarcopenia because we're not utilizing or stressing that musculature so that it can maintain that musculature and maybe they're not eating enough as well. That leads to decreased energy, the feeling of fatigue and exhaustion. And that exhaustion means that our patient will be walking slower and they're just not gonna do as much because they feel exhausted. So again, it's very interdependent, interrelated systems that we're talking about. So how do we measure physical activity of the elderly? One of the best ways is a great scale called the physical activity scale for the elderly, as you can see here. So it consists of 12 different questions that really just talk about the different frequency and duration of um, both leisure activities, household activities, and work-related uh, activities over the previous seven-day period. Just to get kind of a seven-day snapshot of what patients are doing on a regular basis. So this is a good way to measure um, overall physical activity. Another really good way to think about physical activity is a combination measure, which is life space. So life space is a measure of spatial mobility. It's um, defined as the size of spatial area a person purposely moves throughout his or her daily life as well as the frequency of travel within a specific time frame. So as you can see, there's levels of zero to five here, where some people aren't moving outside their bedroom. They're limited to one room. And you can see someone who's limited to one room, all the issues that might be occurring here. If they don't feel safe to even leave their room, they're probably weak. They're probably... Um, uh, they're obviously probably have a decreased gait speed um, because they're not even able to move outside of their room. They're probably experiencing fatigue. So you can see how this is a good way to also measure physical activity. The next is the home. And then you're talking about frequency to actually go outside the home and then outside of the neighborhood, outside of the town, or to go anywhere. So again, that rating of five would be someone who's completely in, uh, unlimited in their life space. So they don't really have any limitations of mobility or activity. While someone who is reserved to maybe just going outside their home a few times a week for short amounts of time, it's a good way to kind of measure overall physical activity and overall limitations. So I really like um, to talk about a patient's life space. All right, and the last measure of frailty that we're gonna talk about is unintentional weight loss. So this is the clinical consequence of involuntary weight loss. So we usually have functional decline, infections, decubit eye ulcers, exacerbations of cognitive and mood disorders, and we can even have increases 
an increased use of acute and long-term facilities. So again, patients are getting weaker. There's lots and lots of different consequences um, just from not getting that adequate nutrition to support themselves. And again, we talk about frailty is really a disease of energetics. If you're not putting enough energy into the system, a lot of things are not going to be able to uh, repair and be able to deal with different stressors. So based on evidence from a large cohort study that involved uh, 4,010 persons age 65 or older in 11 cities in Europe, the most common independent factors associated with unexplained weight loss are those really related to food intake. So we're going to talk about some other additional factors, but a lot of the factors for weight loss are really just decreased food intake, which makes sense. So the people most at risk meal per day it's really hard to maintain your weight if you're eating less than one meal a day. Those that were reported to eat less overall, those who reported a reduced appetite, those with severe malnutrition, and then again, those more physiological ones, as someone with issues swallowing food. This is sometimes underreported and underobserved for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people might be, they're starting to lose weight and um, they're saying, you know, they don't want to eat as much. Sometimes older individuals are a little reserved and sometimes even embarrassed that they might have some issues swallowing and that can actually be a source of anxiety. So again, these are different questions when we really need to ask our patients, try to get to the bottom of why they might be losing weight. Additional factors might be psychological factors. You know, a lot of our patients, um, 65 and older, just might be depressed. And so um, a cross-sectional study of 68 community-dwelling older adults in Midwest USA showed that depression was independently associated with weight loss. Um, I think that's a big telling factor. Again, a lot of times people who are depressed just aren't having that food intake and then we know that how that cycle uh, that cycle works another could be social factors so again um, reduced social activity was also an independent contributor to unexplained weight loss in the older individual so now we are seeing again how these are all interrelated we just talked about um, life space those people not being able to go out not being able to interact with other people. Earlier in the talk, um, we talked about how important it was to have that um, self-perceived wellness, um, that self-perceived uh, feeling that you know they're involved in their life, uh, that life satisfaction. If that is low, people are more likely to be depressed and then more likely to eat less. If they're going to be eating less and losing weight, it really starts that cycle once again. So as we're talking about that undernutrition and weight loss, this really plays back into sarcopenia. Uh, sarcopenia is a topic that you will see quite a bit. We're talking about um, kind of natural changes uh, that happen to individuals as they age, but one thing that we will hit on and I'll get on my soapbox a little bit is that a lot of it can be attenuated by exercise and proper nutrition. So again, our patients can age successfully. So let's go ahead and define sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is the degenerative loss of skeletal muscle, mass, quality, and strength associated with normal aging. It's usually at about a rate of 0.5 to 1% loss per year after age 50. A lot of what we see is replacement of muscle fibers with fat. We see increased fibrosis of the fibers. We also see degeneration of the neuromuscular junction, again blunting the neuromuscular response. The good thing is all these things can be attenuated and can respond to strength training which I'm gonna hit on very hard, that we can really prevent or decrease the rate of a lot of these changes by continually and regularly being involved in strength training procedures. 
So as you can see uh, on the picture on the left, a lot of these changes. So you see that replacement of those muscle fibers with fat. See that fatty infiltrates even inside the muscle fibers. So not just outside and the decrease in overall mass, but we also see that it becomes um, actually embedded, kind of marbled into the different muscle fibers, which makes them a little bit less effective as well. It is um, because it responds to strength training that is so important to actually initiate these strength training interventions as early as possible, again, to build that muscle reserve and delay those eventual functional limitations. So if we know that our muscle mass and strength are going to decrease 0.5 to 1% per year after age 50, wow, how important it is to actually build up the mass um, before 50 so that with that degeneration, you have so much reserve that you can age successfully. That is why really sarcopenia is actually a disease, I feel, of younger people. Because if younger people don't build the strength and mass when they are younger and have um, the hormonal and neuromuscular facility to do so, then they can definitely blunt or delay uh, sarcopenia from happening and not making it so that when they do have that loss over time, so that it doesn't actually affect their function or make have them functional limitations or different disabilities. So some of the things that we see with sarcopenia is a loss of strength that's going to be actually greater than the percentage of loss of total lean mass. And this is explained primarily with the decrease in those type 2 muscle fibers. Um, well, the type 1 muscle fibers are actually largely unchanged. We're going to talk about that a little bit. So your type 2 muscle fibers are the ones with the myosin heads that are a little bit larger. In general, type 2 muscle fibers in general are larger. And if you remember, those are those anaerobic, very explosive, high power fibers. Now, they only stay around and stay active in hypertrophy if you're using them. So that means in order to maintain those type 2 muscle fibers fitness, you need to be doing activities that are both heavy, so it's stressing the actual um, musculature of those type 2, those, those stronger muscle fibers. So this is more um, heavy weightlifting. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in the... Um, you know, 75% of one rep max and above. And you also need to be doing um, things with lower weights more quickly. Again, those explosive type anaerobic activities versus those type one muscle fibers who are a little bit more uh, aerobically uh, fitness trained, okay? What we also see is this denervation of those type two muscle fibers because they're not really being utilized very well and they're actually innervated by um, the motor units of type 1 fibers. They essentially turn those type 2 fibers into functionally type 1 motor fibers. So those previously type 2 fibers start um, firing um, in similar fashions to the type 1 fibers. So again, we have less overall strength and we have less explosiveness. That carries over to a lot of the activities we need to be able to do which is simply get out of a chair, walk quickly, all these different things that those type 2 muscle fibers are so important for. So again, that loss of strength is actually even more than the loss of total lean mass. But we do lose lean mass as well. So lean mass contributes up to 50% of total body weight in young adults. However, it decreases to about 25% by 80 years of age. We're talking about individual muscles. The cross-sectional area of the vastus lateralis reduces by 40%, and the total muscle fibers decrease by 25%. Again, we see loss of muscle mass exchange with that gain in fat, and we especially see that in uh, the lower limb muscles, especially the larger muscles of the lower limb. Again, that neuromuscular changes that we're seeing 
we see slowing of muscle contractile properties and that rate of force development. Again, things that we're not utilizing as much. So if we're not um, doing activities that require quick force development, we're going to lose some of these adaptations. So we see reduced rate of cross bridge cycling, alterations in ex excitation and contraction coupling, and we see increased compliance of muscles uh, tendinous attachments. So again, a lot of different negative changes by not um, stressing these different systems. Again, all of these can be addressed by doing strength training activities and power activities. One last note about the nervous system is that half of muscle mass decline with age is actually from, again, that loss of innervation that we talked about. So we talked about some of those type 2 muscle fibers. They're being unenervated and then re-innervated by those type 1 muscle fibers. Well, also we have some that are just not innervated, uh, re-innervated at all. So we have some of those, um, uh, again, fewer motor units that are actually controlling um, more fibers. So um, some of those motor units that used to be multiple motor units to, to call, um, innervating these fibers, we actually have fewer total motor units um, doing more fibers and being actually less efficient with it. However, again, this can be amenable to with training. So Power et al. found that motor unit estimates in the anterior tib in master's runners uh, were not significantly different than the younger populations, while uh, untrained elderly with significant lower estimated motor units. So what we're seeing is that with these people who have trained since they were young and have continued that training for a long time and been consistent with it, we really don't see these changes. It really reflects back to that um, old uh, saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's really what we see. Um, you know, physical stress theory teaches us that if we don't utilize or stress these different systems, then we're not going to see adaptations to those systems. So this makes sense, but the evidence also supports it. So finally, what do we do about it? We're really now going to dive into the, the importance of exercise, which I've tried to briefly stress as we've gone through some of these things, um, but just how important it is to make sure that we are helping patients have successful lives, how they age successfully, and um, ability to enjoy their lives and be functional. So the American College of Sports Medicine uh, recommends that for important health benefits, older adults need at least uh, two hours and 30 minutes or 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activities every week, as well as weight training, which they define weight training as muscle strengthening activities on two or more days a week that work all major muscle groups. So that's the legs, the hips, the back, the abdomen, the chest, the shoulders, and the arms. Or one alternative could be one hour and 15 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity instead of the two and a half hours of moderate intensity. So again, they're basically rating um, vigorous activity as a two to one ratio of importance to moderate activity meaning you can do about half the amount of aerobic activity if you do it more vigorously to get the same effect, while still recommending at least two days of muscle strengthening activities for all major muscle groups. So metabolic equivalence is, is a good way to measure overall activities. So again, with those recommendations of moderate versus vigorous uh, intensity, those are really correlated to what metabolic equivalents these different activities elicit. So for moderate intensity, like the 150 minutes that were recommended, um, this is anything, any activities that are about from um, uh, 3 to 5.9 mets, so anything um, from 3 to just under 6 mets. As you can see, some of the activities that a person would just generally do at home actually meet a lot of those requirements. So 
just sweeping the carpet, gardening, playing with your dog, uh, washing or waxing the car, playing with kids or could be grandchildren. Um, all of those are actually moderate intensity. So when you really think about only 150 minutes of moderate intensity, that's really not that much. This is kind of a, a bare minimum. And then for vigorous intensity, it's anything over um, six, which we're going to talk about a little bit more on the next slide with formal exercise. So again, as far as the metabolic equivalents for more formal exercise, you can see that even walking briskly doesn't really get you quite up into that vigorous intensity. Um, we're really needing to get to um, uh, weightlifting very quickly um, or swimming, calisthenics, running. So these are actual activities that are going to really um, stress these patients. So um, again, uh, aerobic dancing, heavy gardening, things that really have you um, uh, breathing hard. I mean, that's really what strengthens your aerobic capacity. You have to be breathing hard for these activities to be stressing those systems for those adaptations. So next we're going to talk about resistance training programs. So uh, it should really be stated and make sure that we know that a properly designed program with appropriate instructions for the exercise technique and spotting if necessarily is healthy for older adults. Um, yes, of course they have to be careful. Yes, we have to take into consideration uh, their bone structure kind of their starting place, and it needs to um, uh, progress slowly over time. But patients can reach very high levels of fitness from very deconditioned states if with proper nutrition and proper programming over time. So some of those principles of resistance training that we're going to talk about are individualization, progression, and periodization. And note that this is the same for a young athlete um, an advanced athlete or an older adult. We're talking about changes to a biological system. And yes, we do need to take some things into account with older adults, but also I think it's important that we look at our older adults as athletes. These are just senior athletes, and maybe they're starting from a very deconditioned lower state, but it is our job to safely get them to a higher level of fitness and functionality. So the first thing about our program that's going to be important is that it is individualized. So we need to make individualized assessments and individualized modifications to the program so that it properly fits the patient. You shouldn't have the same exercise program for every person that you work with. You're not doing a skilled intervention if you have the same thing. Those... Um, modifications and the individualized actual exercises you do should actually correlate to what the patient is weak at or where the patient needs um, the most prog progress. They need to be monitored and designed to meet the unique physical, psychological, and medical challenges to that individual, including different comorbidities, orthopedic issues, mobility, and activity toleration. So we definitely need to make sure that a patient has been medically cleared before you start an exercise program with them, medically cleared by their doctor, that you take a full history of their orthopedic issues, any maybe cardiovascular issues, neurological issues. But after that, the patient needs to be monitored and um, make sure that you're doing things that are in line with their goals and what um, goals that they have to achieve. Again, supervision is very important, uh, definitely to make sure that we facilitate optimal improvements in muscle strength and also balance, especially with more coordinated movements that we might have some of our patients do, as, as, uh, especially initially, we need to make sure that they're able to perform these in a safe manner. So progression. So one of the biggest principles in any kind of exercise, whether that be aerobic exercise or resistance exercise, is progression and progressive overload. So 
For anyone to make progress, they need to progressively overload the system. That just means things need to get harder over time. So overload has actually been defined as at least, at minimum, 60% of the muscle's maximum force generation capacity must be exposed to a stimulus to improve force generation. So what that means is you, if you want to improve force generation or strength, what you need to be able to do is move um, resistance that is at least 60% of your one rep max or your maximum force generating capacity, okay? And of course, there is a dose-response relationship. The greater the stimulus, the greater the improvement. If you continue to do things that are 60%, um, you probably won't get the same response as if you're doing moving weights or resistance that's about 70% of your one rep max, okay? The other thing it has to meet is it has to be progressive. It has to get harder over time to continue to elicit adaptations. Your body adapts to the stimulus you give it. You have a stimulus, a recovery period, and then an adaptation that occurs. And now you have a new level of fitness. With that new level of fitness, if you don't overload or progressively overload and make it harder once again, then you aren't going to have an adaptation that is going to uh, improve your fitness once again. So it's a great diagram on the top left about meeting those two components. So those dashed mark right there is kind of the overload threshold. So the first key that we need to meet is that the stimulus we provide is overloading. So if none of those stimuli are actually above that 60% of the one rep max, you're probably not providing overload. Now this is after a patient has actually got up to a reasonable level of fitness. Um, one thing we should note is that some patients who are deconditioned, just doing anything, any activity, is probably overloading initially. But eventually, we need to be start pushing um, higher levels of resistance. And the second component it has to meet is that it is getting harder over time. It's progressively getting harder. Um, as you can see in that diagram. The other thing we talked about was periodization. So again, I had just mentioned in the previous slide about stimulus, recovery, and adaptation. So that's an SRA curve, but it's a good description of the adaptations we get with exercise. So the stimulus could be uh, aerobic stimulus, going for a run, or it could be a strength training stimulus, lifting a heavy weight. After that stimulus, your um, fitness, which is measured on the y-axis, is going to initially decline. If you lift, um, do uh, heavy uh, leg activities one day, very um, highly stimulating, um, your fitness will actually decline, meaning the next day you probably can't even do the workout you did the day before. That makes sense. And then over time you recover metabolically from that, your body makes adaptations, and next thing you know, that fitness level has increased. And then over time, you give a new stimulus, and then you have a decrease in fitness, and then a recovery and an increase with that adaptation. And that's really how all exercise programs should be set up. So as you can see on the bottom left, what happens over time, what we call periodization, you really need times where you're making things harder and harder and harder over time until you get to a point where you really can't do any more and patients aren't able to recover. That MRV uh, on the left is that maximum recoverable volume. So that's kind of the amount of activity that you can no longer recover from or your patient can no longer recover from. At that time, you need to give them some rest so that they can recover. That's called a deload period. So that's usually a week or two where they do very little activity um, to let their body kind of recover. They let their muscles recover. They let their joints and tendons recover. And then they can start another training process again. So some of the things that we need uh, to think about is the program needs to be individualized. It needs to be 
um, progress progressive so progressive overload and it needs to be periodized meaning it's hard for a while progressively harder and then you need time um, to deload and recover your patients okay you need easier times again as far as intensity um, really individuals need to be working out to where they're doing two to three sets of one to two multi-joint exercises per major muscle group and achieving intensities of 70 to 85 percent of a one rep max two to three times per week okay so if we look over on the repetition matchup with the one rep max the diagram on the left you can see a 70 percent um, one rep max is a patient being able to do an exercise 11 times and then being at complete uh, muscu concentric muscular failure, okay? And then 85% is only being able to do it six times, which is much more in those strength ranges. So anywhere between those is kind of where you need to be putting your patients up to. I think that's very much in stark contrast to how we think to strength training with geriatric populations. When we think about using light TheraBand and light ankle weights and have them doing, um, you know, sets of 15 and 20. Yes, that might be good at the beginning of a program when someone is very deconditioned, but really we need to do better for our patients um, and really start stressing those, sips, uh, those systems if we want them to adapt and get better. Um, and the other thing we need to be doing is doing powerful exercises. So like I talked about things at high velocities, and these are going to have to be done at moderate or lower intensities. So about 40 to 60% of a one rep max. So again, you need to be moving um, heavy things, and you need your patients to be moving light things quickly. And what do both of those things achieve? Again, this cycles back to those type 2 muscle fibers that we see lost the most with sarcopenia. How do we address those? Those are the fibers that are activated with very heavy tensile loading. And then those are activated when they have to be produce um, force generations very quickly. High velocity movements. This is the power movements that we're talking about here. So it makes sense why we... Um, are addressing it in this manner. A different way to think about working with our geriatric populations, but one that is truly going to benefit them. We really need to change the paradigm. This is a good visual representation of this. Which one is training and which one is not? Are we really doing the best for our patients by having them do one pound weight bicep curls for 100 reps and the patients aren't even tired? Or are we having them really do heavy functional movements, safely of course, and really stressing these symptom uh, systems, okay? So now let's talk about some of the adaptations we're going to elicit with our strength training. Number one, and most notably, muscle cell hypertrophy or muscle growth. So even in individuals up to 85 years of age, we see that denervation taking place. However, especially when we're training closer to the lower end of the one rep max strength, the higher percentage of one rep max, we're definitely going to get more of that maximum motor unit recruitment. And what is that going to turn into? Increased force generation that we've talked about. So we can see strength and power improvements, again, in individuals even greater than 85 years of age. Um, we also know that resistance training has demonstrated marked improvements in both skeletal muscle power, ranging from 14% increase to even a 97% increase when we do that power training. Again, that's that high-velocity resistance training. So that is, again, those lighter loads between 40 and 60%, that one rep max, light loads being moved very quickly, again, targeting those type 2 muscle fibers. We also see enhanced maximum motor unit firing rates and elevated spinal motor neuronal excitability. 
the exact opposite of all the things that we see um, happen with frailty and sarcopenia when we see those losses taking place. So again, our strength training is really going to attenuate all those different losses that we might have if we're not doing it. So, so very important for both ourselves as individuals and for our patients. Other very important benefits of strength training is that mechanical loading is a fundamental factor for bone mass accretion, meaning to generate the adaptive responses of bone osteogenesis or formation, we need mechanical loading and mechanical loading of a sufficient magnitude, rate, and frequency. And that's typically most adequately seen when it's loading through the long bones of the skeleton um, with significant forces and regularly. So again, we see the greatest skeletal benefits with resistance exercises when the resistance was progressively increased over time and the magnitude of mechanical loading was very high. Again, around 80 to 85% of the one rep max for maximum skeletal benefits. Again, this is that heavy loading, heavy lifting. When I showed the picture of the elderly uh, female doing a deadlift, that's really what we're talking about here. Really chat patients as long as they can progress to that level in a safe, gradual manner. This is the best thing to prevent bone loss. Uh, we also know that power training maintained bone mineral density in postmenopausal women also without increasing their risk of injury or pain. So it's definitely um, uh, important for women as well because they have um, extra rates of bone loss due to menopause. So some additional benefits that we're seeing as well are the psychological health benefits for our older adults. So we know that resistance exercise programs have been effective in lowering both self-reported and therapist-rated levels of depression in our older adults. It's even been shown that resistance training has offers a similar antidepressant efficacy as standard pharmacotherapy meaning similar outcomes from putting a patient on an antidepressant versus just have them do resistance exercise. That is pretty powerful, especially when you combine it with all the other benefits that we've already talked about. It can also mitigate behavioral problems such as social disturbance, communication difficulty, self-care, and confusion that are associated with advanced stages of dementia. So what do we see with exercise in general that we can educate our patients on? It can improve their mood. Pro you can have positive changes in confusion, reduced anger, reduced anxiety, improved quality of sleep, reduced tension, improved overall vigor and spatial awareness. We can see improved visual and physical reaction times and increased self-efficacy all these benefits from resistance training. Uh, this is one of the many reasons I'm so very passionate about uh, imploring our older individuals to um, be engaged in progressive resistance training activities. Besides just standard resistance training that we think of in a gym with weights or other forms of resistance, one thing I did want to mention is functional training. Again, that goes to the law of specificity. So specificity and the said principle is we make specific adaptations to specific imposed demands, meaning we get good at the things that we practice. And we know this um, from a wide range of different studies from motor control to resistance studies. So what we really want to say is that we really need to incorporate functional training with our patients. Having our patients do dynamic, multi-joint, complex movements on varied different surfaces that really um, mimic their um, daily environment and tasks that they do on a daily basis. Um, when we do this, we can improve their ability to perform ADLs and because we're doing very specific movements that have very good carryover to what they do on a daily basis. So trials have even shown a lot of carryover where functional training programs have shown positive effects on ADL performance that can be sustained even six months after the conclusion of the training. 
So very important that we also think about when we're thinking about movements, make sure that they're not just strengthening movements, but they're strengthening movements that also mimic what our patients need to do on a daily basis. Next, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the importance of nutrition to support the resistance activities we're doing. So there are some dietary changes um, that are recommended with aging, or at least considerations we need to think about. So this is the new food pyramid. It's changed quite a bit, um, specifically for older adults over the age of 70. And what I really love about this new pyramid is it really prioritizes physical activity and exercise as a key pillar, as you see on the bottom. Next is followed by proper hydration, which is so very important, not only for physiological function, but for cognitive function for these patients. Um, so many of our patients um, have declines in overall function because they just aren't drinking enough water and are getting chronically dehydrated. So I really like um, the way that this is set out for our patients. The number one thing we need to talk about in regards to nutrition is caloric intake. Now we do know, of course, that someone who is um, obese or morbidly obese, um, of course these are things that we need to, to reduce calories so they get into a healthy weight recommendation. But I also want to um, make mention of Again, a lot of our patients aren't taking in enough nutrition, especially our geriatric patients. They have that chronic undernutrition. Um, we have get micronutrient deficiencies, inadequate, especially levels of protein. And we get weight loss, and then that leads to our sarcopenia and all our other issues. So I definitely would, um, battling weight, diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease, some of these other comorbidities, an isocaloric or a slightly hypercaloric diet, meaning they're maintaining weight or just very slowly gaining weight so that they can prevent weight loss and uh, increase um, retention of lean mass. So besides an adequate overall caloric intake, um, the main thing we need to really be worried about is protein intake. Now, at one time, uh, it was held that there was a possibility of higher protein intake being harmful to our patients because of possible risk for toxicity or impaired renal function. Um, that has largely been uh, refuted. Recent research suggests that actually a moderately high protein intake is necessary for maintaining nitrogen balance and offsetting age-related lower energy intake decreased protein synthetic efficiency, and impaired insulin action. So right now, the IOM currently recommends for both older and younger adults that the consumption of 1 to 1.3 grams per kilogram of lean mass um, per day should be ingested of dietary protein with twice-weekly progressive resistance exercises to reduce age-related muscle mass. So again, all of these recommendations from all these governing bodies are saying two to three times a week, you really need to be working on heavy progressive resistance um, activities. You need to be getting an adequate amount of nutrition to support the recovery from those, and especially making sure that we get an adequate amount of protein. However, what we know about protein intake is sadly only 6% of men age 71 and above, and only 4-6% to 6 of women age 50 and above are actually meeting that recommended intake level of 1 to 1.3 grams per kilogram. Here's some more supporting evidence. For men and women with sarcopenia between the ages of 70 to 79, a study found that individuals with the highest protein intake lost the least amount of lean muscle mass over a three-year period. So we saw a greater proportion loss of lean muscle mass. The greater the proportion of fat mass, the greater the risk of metabolic imbalances and chronic disease. So we really want to prevent that loss of lean muscle mass. Additionally, lean, uh, loss of lean muscle mass increases a patient's likelihood of falling. That's why it's so important to maintain that muscle mass in older adults to prevent these from taking place. Again, how do we do that? Adequate amount of protein, 
adequate amount of calories, and proper resistance training activities. Again, um, a study by Hannon in 2000 found that higher protein intake was also associated with lower bone loss. Again, more support for an adequate amount of protein intake. So what are more specific protein recommendations? And this is important to, to realize, is that it takes, there's kind of a threshold that we have to hit to actually initiate protein synthesis. So it's about 25 to 30 grams of protein we have found maximally stimulates mo muscle protein synthesis in both young and older individuals. However, we do know that ingestion over the 30 grams or about 10 grams of those essential amino acids in a single meal dose does not really further enhance the stimulation of the muscle protein synthesis. So we really need about 25 to 30 grams of good protein per meal spread out throughout the day is really your best option for recommendations. And I'm gonna go a little bit more into specifics in just a second. However, we know that many older people may be consuming only just minimal amounts of protein at each meal throughout the day and not really reaching that threshold of intake. So it's kind of like that all or none principle that really getting trace amounts of protein throughout the day that adds up to what you need isn't really what we, what we want. We want kind of um, larger doses of protein spread out throughout the day. So again, you have to kind of meet that minimum threshold. And again, this is for you as well. That minimum threshold of 25 to 30 grams of high quality protein that contain about 10 grams of essential amino acids to, um, to stimulate that protein synthesis. So let's just quickly go through a functional example. In this example, we have a 78-year-old male who weighs 90 kilograms or about 200 pounds. So you multiply 90 times 1 to 1.3 grams per kilogram of lean mass. And in this, we're going to assume that the patient's weight is mostly lean mass. And that comes out to about 90 to 117 grams of protein per day. So a couple of different options for that range. Again, we need that 25 to 30 grams of protein in every meal to really get that muscle protein synthesis. So option one on the lower end would be to do three meals of about 30 grams of protein each spread evenly throughout the day. Or if a person with a little higher appetite or higher activity level who could get four meals in a day, then you would recommend them doing four meals of about 25 to 30 grams of protein each spread evenly throughout the day. Um, the four times would uh, four times 30 is about 120 grams. So, you know, that's the higher end of the spectrum. And three times 30 would be 90, the lower end. Either one would probably be fine and meet that minimum or maximum threshold without going over or without oversatiating our patients. Next, we're going to talk just briefly about vitamin supplementation. So there's a large body of epidemiological evidence that suggests eating a rich diet um, especially in fruits and vegetables and with rich sources of vitamins has a protective effect on development and disease. So that's where we get a lot of our recommendations for intake of fruits and vegetables for most of these nutrients. However, failing compliance with a natural source of essential nutrients in all populations um, are at risk for vitamin deficiency, but especially older adults. So vitamin supplements should be encouraged for those patients. Again, we shouldn't overdose vitamins. Um, just a regular multivitamin or specific vitamin supplement so a patient isn't getting through their natural diet um, should be done at replacement doses, not super therapeutic doses. Um, those should be avoided. One vitamin I wanted to make special mention of is vitamin D. It seems like the research keeps coming out on just how beneficial vitamin D is. And now they're actually kind of turning vitamin D almost to have hormonal effects at some point. Um, so why do we need vitamin D? And why is especially D3 so important for our patients? Well, for one reason, the skin of the elderly produces less vitamin D in general than younger people. They also spend much less time in the sun overall and are at very high, very much higher risk for vitamin D deficiency. 
We also know that vitamin D deficiency is really correlated with a lot of different uh, risk factors. Risk factors for osteoporosis, for cardiovascular disease, for hypertension, and for type 2 diabetes. So, how much should we prescribe our patients a day? It's on a little bit of a sliding scale. So for everyone from basically 1 to 70 years old, they recommend about um, 600 IUs. Um, and over 70, a little bit more. Again, that's due to decreased overall absorption and utilization um, as we age. However, data from a European uh, report revealed a prevalence of vitamin D deficiency up to 40% among institutionalized and or hip fracture patients, which is a major concern. So a lot of people just aren't getting that all, all the way in. All right, next we are going to shift one last time to our final topic, which is how do we help our patients make these health behavior changes. So the first kind of concept I want to introduce you to is the trans theoretical model of change. And it's the idea that health behavior changes involve progress through these six different stages of change. The first stage is pre-contemplation stage, where there's really no intention of taking action. If you have a patient that's in this stage, it is going to be very difficult for them to get to the preparation or action phase. But again, this is our job and we're going to give you some tools to try to help them do that and different ways that you might be successful. We also have to recognize that behavior change is very difficult. And if a patient isn't ready to buy in um, for any number of reasons, then you really can't help them make some of these changes. You can also can't be too hard on yourself. The next stage is the contemplation stage in which the patients have intentions to take actions and they plan to do so in the near future. So they're at least planning to do it. The next stage is the preparation phase, phase where there is the intention to take the action and they've actually started to take some steps towards that action. Finally, we have the action stage where the behavior has been changed at least for a short period of time. Then we move into the maintenance phase where that behavior becomes more normalized and regular and the change continues to be maintained for the long term. And then finally, hopefully, we get to that termination phase where there's really no desire to return to the prior negative behaviors before. So for at-risk populations, the general uh, rule of thumb is that about 40% of our patients uh, that are at risk are in that pre-contemplation phase, about 40 are in the contemplation phase, and only about 20% are in the preparation phase. That means for those at-risk populations, those 40% in the pre-contemplation phase, that's about 40% of, of all the people that haven't started making actions aren't really even ready to start doing actions. They haven't even really had intention of doing it. So that means about 40% of your kind of difficult patients in changing behavior just aren't going to be ready to change behavior. So again, you can't be too hard on yourself. The next concept I'd like to talk into, which is going to guide us into uh, the principle of motivational interviewing, is self-determination theory. This theory is really designed to support the patient's intrinsic tendencies. So it says that um, engagement and motivation of an individual is down to um, three kind of different factors. That's one, a patient's competence, so uh, their mastery of, of doing an activity. So when you think about competence, maybe in and exercises, maybe we want them to um, exercise more regularly, and that's the intervention we want to do or the behavior we want to train change. Uh, they need mastery of it, and they want to feel like they, they're effective at doing it. So this is where we come into teaching the patient on how to do the activities um, successfully, how to perform the exercises correctly, all these different things that will increase their competence. Next, we have autonomy, having to make their own choice in their own behavior. This is where we need to really listen to our patients and, again, give them the autonomy of what activities they actually want to do. 
If your goal is to get someone more active and they're very interested in walking, but you really want them to do bike riding, they're probably not going to be nearly as successful because it wasn't their idea. It's not an activity that they want. So you can educate them that one might be more beneficial than the other, but you really need to listen to your patients. And then finally, relatedness or feeling connected to others, having that sense of belonging. This is what's so great about group um, exercise programs and group weight loss programs like Weight Watchers is they have a support network um, involved in it all together where they really feel like you're supported by other people, where you belong and that you feel really connected. Self-determination theory really goes hand in hand with the intervention of motivational interviewing. So this is a type of general conversation used to increase a patient's motivation and commitment to making their changes. So it's really based around being collaborative, again, cooperating, uh, cooperative partnership between both the patient and the clinician or the coach. Um, evocation, so evoking the patient um, that which they already have to activate their own motivation and resources for their change. And then again, honoring the patient's autonomy. And that's where we talk about um, kind of detachment, detachment from outcomes, but not an absence of caring, but rather an acceptance that people can do and make choices for their own lives. So there's four guiding principles that we talk about with motivational interviewing. First is resist telling them what to do. If you tell someone else what to do, that's a very easy way to get knowledge across, but it's not. it doesn't make that patient feel like they're, ta they're doing it themselves. It takes away that autonomy that we've been talking about. So the second thing we need to do, motivations and potential barriers for changing that behavior. And then finally, and one of the most important things, is we need to empower them. That's the opposite of telling them what to do, is empowering them um, to work with them to set achievable goals and to identify specific techniques to overcome barriers. So when you talk to them about what barriers they might have to exercising, lack of transportation, maybe they have lack of money for a gym membership, that's when you problem solve with them and you say, how can we overcome these? Do you think you could get um, a discount at the gym if we went and talked to them? Do you think that you, um, your daughter could give you a ride to the gym when she goes three days a week? So helping them problem solve and overcoming those barriers to really empower them to meet their goals. And a final thing for goal setting, once again, is that kind of autonomy, that buy-in. So for older adults, setting goals through a collaborative arrangement becomes really a partnership between the individual and the healthcare professional um, will really contribute to greater adherence. So how are we going to get that adherence or that buy-in um, to specific goals? Is make sure the goal is very specific to what the individual wants. You know, what are they trying to get out of this? Make sure it's not just, again, a general goal that you're giving with all people. That you make it very specific to the patient and their life. And then make sure the patient helps participate in actually setting the goal. If you, again, you can give the, you can get, empower the patient and give them the autonomy to write their own goals, they're going to be much more successful. So you have enlightened us how a dose of physical activity or exercise is described by the duration, frequency, intensity, and mode. For optimal effects, the elder person must the body systems scientifically. To induce improvements in physiological parameters such as VO2 max, and muscular strength. Thank you very much, sir. May I request 
Professor Bindu S, Head Department of Biotechnology, Ramaya Institute of Technology, Bangalore. Thank you, Dr. Kishore. It is indeed an honor and my privilege to introduce Dr. Sonia Rawal, Assistant Professor of Physical Therapy, University of St. Mary, Kansas. Dr. Sonia Rawal began her academic career in India where she earned a bachelor's in physical therapy. She then completed a master's in physical therapy, specializing in neurology. Her professional career in India included working at some of Asia's most prestigious and advanced spine orthopedic and neuromuscular center and rehabilitation units equipped with aquatic therapy. There she treated a variety of patients including but not limited to spinal cord injury, stroke, and total knee replacement. As an inveterate learner, she decided to pursue her doctorate in rehabilitation science from the University of Kansas Medical Center. She joined as a postdoctoral fellow at KUMC Kansas Center soon after she graduated from the PhD program in 2016. Dr. Rawal has a wide ranging research background that includes basic science as well as clinical research. Her doctoral dissertation involved novel projects focused on improving pancreatic islet viability and functioning that culminated into patents. Dr. Rawal also has extensive clinical research experience gained while working on a large multi-center study examining the efforts of diet and exercise therapy in patients with diabetic neuropathy. She has numerous publications in reputable journals and also serves on a journal editorial board. Throughout her career, Dr. Rawal has been actively engaged in teaching and mentoring students. Before joining the University of St. Mary in 2018, she held multiple teaching positions during her career in India and the United States. Dr. Rawal is an AIB certified vestibular rehabilitation therapist and also a certified LSVT DIG clinician. Dr. Rawal is licensed to participate in the state of Missouri. So this is a small glimpse into the um, excellent and uh, prolific uh, you know, work done by Dr. Sonia Rawal. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Professor Bindu. May I now request uh, Dr. Sonia Rawal, an eminent uh, physical therapist of uh, international repute to deliver a lecture on physical activity for elderly people with chronic diseases or to Dr. Sonia Rawal. Hello everyone, I'm Sonia Rawal and uh, I am an assistant professor at University of St. Mary's in Kansas, USA. And uh, today I will be talking about the physical activities uh, for elderly people and we will be touching base uh, majorly the chronic diseases for the older people. So a little bit about my background. I did my high schooling um, in 1999 from Madhya Pradesh. I know it is long back. And uh, then I went ahead and did my bachelor's in physical therapy. I graduated in 2003 uh, and um, the institute was located in Madhya Pradesh as well. After that, I worked in different clinical settings and one of the clinical setting is the Indian Spinal Injury Center in Delhi. Uh, they get a lot of neurological patients, especially the spinal cord injury patients from all around Asia. Uh, they also have a hydrotherapy pool um, for uh, utilize for the rehabilitation of spinal cord injury patients. And um, you can uh, see this here. This is the Indian Spinal Injury Center. Then I went ahead and did my master's in physical therapy. That was from Faridabad, Haryana, and this is the institute over here. Uh, 
uh, after uh, completing my bachelor's in physical therapy i moved to united states of america and uh, from here i did my phd as well as post doctoral fellowship uh, my phd was focused on diabetes and my post doctoral fellowship was focused on cancer and this is the place uh, where i work currently this is university of saint mary's in united states of america kansas and uh, i work here as an assistant professor in the department of physical therapy so today we are going to talk about the elderly people and we will specially be focusing on some of the chronic diseases that elderly people face and uh, what are some of the physical activities that they can do if they have those conditions so just a little idea about the world population uh, world population is definitely increasing but uh, the aging population that is the people above 60 years of age are also increasing if you will see here on the right in 1990 uh, people above 60 years of age were about 0.5 billion today they are in 2017 uh, today about 1 billion so the number has approximately doubled now if we move to uh, projected numbers of 2050 you can see the num this number is going to increase even more and the aged population or older people above 60 years of age will be about 2 billion um now let us look at these world graph shown on the right side the darker blue spots as well as uh, the lighter blue spots these ones and these darker ones the darker blue spots this is about 2019 and uh, these areas with lighter blue and then darker blue spots they had uh, people above 65 years of age more than 10% in 2050 these are the projected numbers and you can see these darker spots are increasing and even um, these light blue spots are increasing in number and area um, that just shows that there will be more and more areas in the world in 2050 that will have a population above 65 years of age so in 2010 uh, about 8% of the world population was above the age of 65 years and in 2050 it is projected that 16% of the world population is going to be above the age 65 so the speed of uh, population uh, that is aging is uh, is really fast although in the developed countries um, for example here you can see france um, it took france about you know 100 years to uh, double its population above the age of 60 but in developing countries like japan china brazil um india it will uh, take 25 to 35 years um to double its uh, population above the age of 60 years so um the world definitely is in the phase of demographic transition and um earlier we have always seen uh, that there were more newborns uh, than people above the age of 65 years if you see here but um, as the years are uh, passing by and our aging population is increasing you can see that um, there is a trend where you would actually see that the aging population is going to suppress or suppress uh, the number of newborns in the world so let us talk about india um the trend follows the similar ways at as, as it is in the world that aging population is increasing and if you follow this purple line you can see that a uh, number of people above the age of 65 years are constantly on the rise um in one of the uh, research i found that in 1951 there were about 20 million people in india who were above age 60 In 1991 there were 57 million people and this number is projected to increase to about definitely more than 300 million people above the age of 60 60 years in 2050. And all this definitely healthcare system have to be ready uh, for um, this increase in number. 75% of elderly people living in India still live in villages 
and out of them about 48 percent of elderly people are women and um, according to this study in done in 2008 about 2 lakh people living in India are 100 years or older than 100 years uh, if you look at this chart on your left, um, you will see, so this graph here, please focus here. This graph talks about uh, 50 people above 55 years of age. And uh, it, this graph talks about which diseases are more common. So if you'll see this graph, you'll find that uh, these are the acute cases or acute conditions or diseases. These are chronic diseases, these are accidents, and these are not really determined. Um, so if you follow this graph, you can very clearly see that people above 55 years of age are more prone for chronic conditions. And um, there was a study done by Indian Council of Medical Research and uh, list down the different common uh, chronic diseases that elderly people face. Out of that, they listed hearing and vision problems as the top ones, followed by hypertension. And then they also noted down these other chronic diseases that they found in elderly people. Uh, those are heart diseases, cancer, uh, diarrhea, chronic cough, respiratory disorders like asthma, other metabolic disorders uh, like diabetes, um, uh, imbalances in their lipid profile leading to dyslipidemia. Uh, their cholesterol levels were not within the normal levels. Um, and, um, and so today we are going to talk about some of these conditions uh, like diabetes, uh, hypertension. And then um, we will also be talking about one of the other uh, common neurological condition uh, that is the Parkinson's disease. In this section, we will be talking about hypertension. Hypertension affects people around the world and it is responsible for one in eight deaths worldwide. So more than 27,000 people die each day because of hypertension. And uh, the fact is that 50% don't even know that they have hypertension. Prevalence of hypertension in men is about 24% and in women it is about 20%. But as um, the age increases, above 60 years of age, the prevalence actually increases to, to more than 60%. While we are talking about hypertension, we have to talk about blood pressure. Hypertension is basically increase in blood pressure. What is blood pressure? Blood pressure is the force that is exerted by the circulating blood against the wall of the body arteries. Blood pressure is written as two numbers, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is the pressure in the blood vessels when the heart contracts. And diastolic blood pressure is the pressure in the vessels when the heart rests between the beats. So hypertension is diagnosed as uh, having a reading above 140 by 90 on two different days. The majority of the causes of hypertension uh, is the primary hypertension. Um, that means that in 95% of cases, the cause is either going to be genetic or lifestyle factors such as high fat diet or salt diet and uh, doing less physical activity. Uh, but there are about 5% of cases where there is a secondary hypertension. That means there is increase in blood pressure, but that is not because of either genetic or lifestyle factors, but that is because of some other disease like um, the blockage in the renal arteries or excessive hormone secretion, that is the aldosterone secretion, or a patient unable to sleep or some kind of chronic kidney disease. Here are uh, the blood pressure categories defined according to the American Heart Association. American Heart Association says that blood pressure is normal when systolic is less than 120 and diastolic is less than 80. It is defined as elevated when systolic blood pressure is between 120 to 129. Uh, stage one hypertension is defined as blood pressure between systolic blood pressure between 130 to 139 and diastolic between 80 to 89. Stage 2 hypertension is defined as uh, blood pressure above 140 or higher and diastolic blood pressure 90 or higher. Hypertensive crisis is defined as blood pressure higher than 180 and uh, systolic pressure higher than 180 and diastolic pressure higher than 120. 
Hypertension is also called as a silent killer. It is called a silent killer because it can lead to many different complications which can be really fatal. It can lead to stroke. High blood pressure can cause the blood vessels in the brain to burst and leading to stroke. It can also damage the vessels of the eye leading to vision loss. Um, hypertension can make the heart work harder and when the heart works harder, it can increase its size, it can get hypertrophy and ultimately there could be heart failure. It can also lead to heart attacks by damaging or blocking the arteries. Hypertension can also cause um, kidney diseases. It can damage the arteries around the kidneys and can interfere with the ability to filter the blood. It can also lead to some sexual dysfunctions like erectile dysfunction in men and uh, lower libido in women. Here are some of the very important things that have been listed down by American Heart Association and American Stroke Association. And these things have really proved to work to improve the blood pressure. First is the weight reduction. If uh, a person tries to reduce their weight, actually that can help with lowering down their systolic blood pressure by five millimeters of mercury. American Heart Association also uh, emphasizes on the eating plan. And for that eating plan, uh, they say that there has to be diet rich in fruits, vegetables, but diet low in fat and uh, also low in dairy like milk products. And we will be discussing about some of these uh, points later in the slides in greater detail. Also restricting sodium intake to less than 1500 milligram of sodium per day can actually lower your blood pressure to again five to six millimeters of mercury. Physical activity has proven, um, proven to be really helpful with reducing the blood pressure. Also uh, lowering down the alcohol consumption, not taking drinks, two drinks, more than two drinks per day for men and one drink per day for women can help also help reduce down um, the blood pressure by about four millimeters of mercury. So physical activity have a lot of different benefits. Here we are talking about hypertension. Definitely it helps reduce the hypertension by five to seven millimeters of mercury. And also uh, the effects with exercise are can be seen just with, you know, like one of the study which was done, which showed that you can see the benefits within three exercise sessions. And uh, the duration of the exercise session, if patient is not able to do or elderly person is not able to do more, it could be as short as 10 minutes. And uh, the intensity of exercise could also be really low. So it is not only helping reduce the hypertension, but it also helps lower the progression of any uh, kind of cardiovascular disease because it is it will help uh, balance your cholesterol levels, the lipid profile. So it is also helping prevent any cardiovascular disease. And uh, with physical activity, definitely you are um, lowering the lowering your weight as well. And later we will see that physical activities will also help reduce the diabetes um, and, and also help reduce the glucose levels in the blood. So here are the recommendations from American College of Sports and Medicine. And uh, they recommend doing aerobic exercise, resistance exercise, as well as flexibility exercises for people who have hypertension. And in the table here on the right, they have mentioned the three different types of exercises that they recommend and their frequency, intensity, time, and um, also the type. So uh, they recommend definitely aerobic exercise uh, at least five times a day and preferably seven times a day per week. Um, intensity of aerobic exercise should be moderate and you can monitor the intensity of exercise with the help of heart rates or also with the help of um, the rate of uh, perceived exertion scale. And on this scale, you should be at the level of 12 to 13. We will discuss about this scale more in our next slide.
the time uh, recommended is at least 30 minutes per day of either continuous or you could just keep doing little bit little bit and then accumulate to 30 uh, minutes uh, in a day uh, then the type of aerobic exercise usually aerobic exercise they are prolonged they're rhythmic they use like large muscle groups like walking cycling and swimming um, resistance exercise should be done at least two to three days per week and uh, you could do two to four sets of eight to 12 repetitions. And it could be either free weights or body weights or resistance machines could be used. Flexibility exercises more than two to three times um, in a week. And stretching should be done to the point of feeling slightly discomfort. Hold the stretch for 10 to 30 seconds, two to four repetitions of each exercise. And any type of stretching could be used. It could be static, it could be dy dynamic, or it could be some neuromuscular facilitatory stretchings. So as I said that, how would you know that you're doing a moderate intensity exercise? So that could be done with the, or calculated or known uh, with the help of uh, heart, uh, heart rate reserve here, which says HRR. And I've described here heart rate reserve. So you can measure uh, the resting heart rate of the patient in the morning and then uh, you could measure their uh, maximum heart rate by calculating uh, 220 minus their age. So you know their maximum heart rate was 220 minus their age. You can calculate the resting heart rate while they're resting maybe early in the morning and then uh, you can calculate the heart rate reserve so um, while they do their exercise they should be around 40 to 60 percent of their heart rate reserve and whenever uh, these patients do um, do start with any kind of exercises there should be a proper warm-up for at least 10 minutes and uh, this warm-up should actually be longer if the patient is older and has been inactive for a long time there should be a proper cool down as well and uh, there should not be any stopping of exercises too quickly otherwise they could be sharp drop in blood pressure and which which could be really dangerous so here is the rate of perceived exertion scale that i was talking about you can have you can print this scale out and then have in front of yourself or if you are working with the patient have in front of whoever is exercising and uh, if and you can keep asking them with the exercises how do you, how do you feel how do you feel you keep asking uh, with the patient or whoever you are making them exercise or yourself and um, if it is somewhere around 12 to 13 here somewhat hard if if, if you feel that the exercise you are doing is somewhat harder then you are doing a moderate intensity exercise and here, if somebody says very hard, here actually, uh, after that, it is going to be a vigorous exercise. Another way to figure out if it is um, a moderate intensity exercise is, um, so uh, these aerobic exercises definitely will make your heart rate go up. And uh, when your heart beats faster, you are going to be also, you will also be breathing uh, more harder. But you should still be able to talk if it is a moderate intensity exercise. Here are some of the examples of moderate intensity exercise uh, like brisk walking, uh, just at home gardening or going for a hiking, um, you know, uh, dancing. You could do some cycling, just active recreation and swimming. So whenever, whenever you're doing all of these activities, if you are able to still intensity exercise. There are definitely some precautions that needs to be taken while, uh, you know, exercising uh, with high blood pressure. Whenever the blood pressure is above 200 for systolic and 100 for diastolic, definitely physician clearance should be obtained. You should make sure from the physician that it is safe for the patient to exercise or any elderly person you know, it is, it is safe for them to exercise. Whenever uh, the blood pressure goes above 250 systolic and above 110 for diastolic, uh, absolutely no exercises should be done at this point. 
So the American Heart Association also recommends lowering down the weight. And it has been seen that if there is 3 to 5% or more weight loss can actually result in uh, different benefits. Like there will be reduced blood glucose levels, uh, triglycerides, lipid profile will be better for the patient. There is going to be reduction in blood pressure. And also there would be improvement with the blood cholesterol. So here are some of the recommendations uh, made by the American College of Sports medicine and uh, they say again a combination of aerobic resistance and flexibility exercises aerobic exercises at least five times a day but here the intensity now can be made from um, moderate to actually patient can also do vigorous exercise if possible and again 30 minutes per day is total of 150 minutes in a week and uh, again, in, you know, including larger muscle groups for aerobic exercise. Resistance exercise could be again two to three, two to three times a day with machines or with uh, free weights. And also supplement that with the flexibility exercises. So now for weight loss, we talked about the moderate intensity exercise as well as vigorous intensity exercise, whatever is possible. So you know moderate. Moderate will make you breathe harder, but you'll still be able to talk. But vigorous intensity exercise will push your body even further and uh, you will actually begin to sweat and you won't be able to talk much without getting out of your breath. Uh, and here are some of the examples of vigorous intensity exercises. So running, uh, walking a hill or climbing a hill, fast cycling, doing some aerobics, fast swimming, doing competitive sports like football, volleyball, hockey and uh, carrying or moving heavy objects. Those would be your vigorous activities. And if you want to look in your rate of perceived exertion scale or the Borg scale on that scale, it would come around at the level of 14 to 17. That is going to be your vigorous activity. So we have talked about healthy eating and healthy diet. Diet does help uh, with lowering down the blood pressure. In order to maintain healthy heart, um, vegetables, fruits, and whole grains should be included in your diet. Also fat-free dairy products, proteins, as well as um, healthy fats should be included, included in your diet. You should limit any sugary, salty uh, food, any processed foods, limit any hydrogenated oils or tropical oils, and uh, just try to include as many food groups you can. So different vegetables, different fruits. And on the right side here in the table, you can see the different food groups and their daily servings that are recommended. If, if someone who is on a 2000 calorie per day diet. So um, about seven to eight servings of grains and uh, try including whole grains, uh, vegetables, four to five servings, fruits, four to five servings. Uh, low fat, about two to three servings, proteins, lean meats, uh, fish, two or more, then nuts, seeds, and beans, four to five per week. Fats and oils, um, the healthy ones, um, two to three uh, servings, and then um, <clears throat> you're allowed to have some sweets, <laughs> five per week. Um, <clears throat> and here are the different serving, serving sizes for each food group. If you are looking for um the daily servings and the serving sizes so one slice of bread will have one serving uh, from the food group or the grain uh, from the food group which is the grain um, part of the food group it is recommended to include as many different varieties of foods as possible so just try to have a more color to your food include fruits and veggies from different colors and families like blue purple which have blueberries blackberries then include from red and pink like beets cherries cranberries from green um, like the broccoli the cucumbers um, green beans etc and then from orange family like orange peppers papayas peaches pumpkins so include as much color as you can into your plate we will now move on to talking about diabetes 
Diabetes is another debilitating and chronic disease. About 422 million people have diabetes around the world. That is one person in 11 people. Diabetes can cause more than or around 1.5 million deaths. Table on the left shows the different countries and uh, their ranking with respect to number of people with diabetes in 2000 and in 2030. In 2000, India had about 31 million people who had diabetes and in 2030, India could have a, approximately very near to 80 million people with diabetes. In India, China and USA are uh, currently leading uh, with the number of people that are suffering with diabetes in these countries. As we are concentrating today on our older population, you can very clearly see in this graph that diabetes increases as the age goes up. Pancreas, which are located in the abdominal cavity, are the major important structures that help uh, maintain the blood glucose levels and help controlling diabetes. So in this figure, you can uh, see the pancreas. These are our pancreas and a zoomed image of these pancreas. They contain different types of structures and cells. Uh, these ones surrounding, they are called as the exocrine cells. And these ones are the endocrine cells or the pancreatic islets. These pancreatic islets have different types of cells. The two most important ones are the alpha cells and the beta cells. Alpha cells, they increase the blood glucose levels in our body and beta cells, they decrease the blood glucose levels in our body. So beta cells are very, very important. Beta cells are the ones that help decrease the blood glucose levels and help um, maintain blood glucose levels and not develop diabetes. But in diabetes, it is those beta cells that are affected and uh, hence person cannot decrease their blood glucose levels. Diabetes is a chronic disease and it is characterized by increase in blood glucose levels. So in our body about uh, 70 to 100 uh, glucose levels are considered as normal and pancreas and the beta cells of the pancreas especially help us maintain the blood glucose levels. So on figure on the left here uh, talks about the hemostasis or the maintenance of normal level of blood glucose levels and how does that take place in our body. When we eat food, the blood glucose levels, it rises. When it rises, the beta cells of the pancreas, they release insulin. This insulin helps glucose that is circulating in our blood and which is in more, which is more in quantity helps that uh, glucose to get inside the different cells of our body for energy. And extra is stored in our liver. And that's, that's how the blood glucose levels they decline. Now, if there is lead blood glucose level, suppose you have not been able to eat well, the blood glucose levels will go down and these blood glucose levels will cause Another type of cells in the pancreas, that is the alpha cells of the pancreas, to release another hormone called as glucagon. This glucagon will break down the glucose levels or the glucose that was stored in the liver and release into the blood. That will cause an increase in the blood glucose levels, again trying to maintain the normal blood glucose levels of 70 to 100. When the beta cells of the pancreas are not able to maintain the normal amount of blood glucose levels, then it results in diabetes. There are two different types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is the one that is because of the deficiency of insulin. That is why it is called as insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Type 2 diabetes mellitus, it, is, it initially does not start because of the insulin, insulin deficiency. It starts because the cells of the body are not able to utilize the glucose. 
that is the reason it is also called as non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus let us look in little detail about the pathophysiology of diabetes and especially type 1 and type 2 diabetes so normally as uh, we said that whenever you eat um, carbohydrates or your food the cells of the pancreas they release insulin this insulin goes to the different cells of the body and helps glucose go inside the cells of the body so that the cells of the body can utilize glucose as the source of energy but in type 1 diabetes the beta cells of the pancreas are either not able to release insulin or these cells are dead and cannot release insulin if there is no insulin the glucose will not be able to get inside the cells and glucose will stay out in the blood leading to increased blood glucose levels in type 2 diabetes there is insulin in the blood and there is insulin that is produced by the pancreas but for some reason this insulin is not able to function well when it cannot function well glucose still cannot go inside the cells so there will be more glucose in the blood as well as there will be more insulin in the blood and your pancreas keep on thinking that there is more glucose so it has to produce more and more insulin so there will be more and more insulin in the blood but insulin is not able to being utilized well so it just keeps floating there so there is more and more insulin in the blood and there is more and more glucose in the blood and ultimately these beta cells that produce insulin they will die and say oh, i cannot produce any more insulin so they are not able to produce more insulin they die and now there is deficiency of insulin but that will take place later in the stage here is how a patient can present with the diabetes they would have frequent urination they would go to restrooms often and frequent urination is called as polyuria they will be fatigued there is going to be weight loss but this weight loss is specifically this happens in type 1 diabetes patient is going to be hungry that is also very characteristic of type 1 diabetes patient is going to be thirsty also a lot that is called as polydipsia the thirst if the blood glucose levels remain elevated for a longer duration of time they can lead to different complications some of the complications are listed here in this figure increased blood glucose levels can affect the arteries of your body leading to hypertension they can also affect the arteries of the brain leading to stroke or hemorrhages vessels of the eyes can also get affected leading to retinopathy and cataracts and also visual loss it can affect the vessels or it can also affect the heart leading to ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction it can affect the gi system or gastrointestinal system leading to diarrhea constipation it can affect the urinary system as well leading to infection as well as erectile dysfunction in males it can affect kidneys leading to nephropathy as well as chronic kidney diseases atherosclerosis can also take place in this the vessels of the limbs are affected and there won't be good blood flow in the limbs especially your distal extremities especially the feet and if there is less blood supply over there it can lead to damage or death of the tissues in the feet leading to gangrene and finally the patient might have to get amputated or the feet removed and prosthesis can be fitted if the atherosclerosis is too bad it can also affect the sensory as well as motor nerves if motor nerves are affected of the limbs the muscles are going to be weaker 
if the sensory nerves are affected in the limbs patient will not be able to feel any sensation if the patient cannot feel any sensation for example if they are walking and uh, they hurt into something that was sharper they will not know and uh, that can constantly lead to uh, development of uh, these ulcers in the foot so foot inspection is very important for people with diabetes every single day they need to see if if there is any ulcer formation or if there is any injury they need to take care of their feet as well so uh, you see that uh, so many complications that can take place because of diabetes and these complication are, uh, are the major cause of morbidity or dependence that these patients have on others for carrying out their daily activities when we talk about diabetes there are three major major big areas that are helpful for the treatment of diabetes first is the medications so um patient will be on insulin if they are type 1 diabetes because you know that in type 1 diabetes there is a death of beta cells and there is insulin deficiency so they have to be given insulin so that they can lower the blood glucose levels in type 2 diabetes initially there is no deficiency of insulin it is just that the insulin is not able to function well so they are not initially on insulin but they are on other drugs such as metformin or tolbutamide and later when um, the beta cells or the insulin cells are fatigued and then they start dying at that time they could be put on insulin diet plays a big role in treatment of diabetes and also exercise have proven to be very beneficial not only in maintaining the blood glucose levels but also in lowering down uh, the medications that they might need to take to control diabetes so here are the recommendations from american uh, college of sports medicine again they say a combination of aerobic resistance and flexibility exercises for patients with diabetes as well aerobic exercise has shown to be very helpful in lowering down the blood glucose levels um, so they say three to seven days per week again moderate to vigorous intensity exercise total of 150 minutes per week uh, of moderate intensity or 75 uh, minute per week at vigorous intensity exercise for type 1 for type 2 they say uh, 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise involving larger groups resistance exercise at least two consecutive days per week uh, maybe three and at least eight to ten exercises one with one to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions uh, flexibility exercises uh, more than two to three uh, days per week so uh, we see that these different exercises not only help lower uh, the blood glucose levels we have seen that these different types of exercises have, have also helped in hypertension lowering down the blood uh, blood pressure along with that cardiovascular risk factors will be reduced uh, triglycerides or lipid profile will get better then cholesterol levels will be lower and in general exercises have always shown to improve the uh, the, the mental health uh, you feel uh, more uh, energetic you feel mentally also more healthier along with these many physical benefits there are some precautions that need to be taken while a patient with diabetes is exercising so exercises will lower the blood glucose levels and they are also taking the medications like insulin or metformin that will also help lower the blood glucose levels sometimes while these patients are exercising their blood glucose levels can actually go down to the dangerous levels and it could be fatal if blood glucose levels goes below 70 then it um, then patient will start to have some symptoms they might start to sweat feel weak and shaky and anxiety and if it is uh, if it goes down to even lower levels then they could have seizures and coma so there needs to be a change in insulin when they take insulin or when they take their medication either the uh, the dose of the medication needs to be reduced or uh, 
the patient should take more uh, food or more carbohydrate before performing any exercise here are just the guidelines if the patient should uh, reduce the doses of medication or have carbohydrate so every time in patient with diabetes exercises their blood glucose level should be checked before the exercise if their blood glucose levels is below 90 then uh, they should ingest some amount which is about 50 to 30 grams of of carbohydrate this could be just any juice any candy that has about 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrate if they are between 90 to 150 then they can they can have carbohydrate snack right um, at the onset of uh, of most exercises then if they are above 150 then uh, there is no need to give them a, a carbohydrate snack before the exercises uh, but while during the exercise they go below 150 then you can give them a snack then uh, if the blood glucose levels are 250 to 350 or if they are above 350 then you should always check for ketones in the urine or the blood if the ketones are present then there should be no exercise at all if um ketones are not present blood blood glucose levels are below 250 then they could do mild to moderate exercise um and if the blood glucose levels are uh, greater than 350 and no ketones are present still um avoid any intense exercises just initiate mild to moderate and so there is like a range um if there is hypoglycemia then you have to take a lot of precaution you should not be exercising give them a snack so their blood glucose levels comes up uh, if they have too high blood glucose levels like above 250 350 you have to be very precautious uh, just do mild moderate intensity exercise until their blood glucose returns uh, to within that you know uh, that range maybe at least less than 250 or 350 and uh, if they have ketones present there is for the ketones they have a stick like a blood glucose there is a stick that you can check for the ketones in their blood or in the urine if the ketones are present that means they are at again their body is not functioning well that could be dangerous for the patient so there are a lot of precautions that needs to be taken if patient with uh, complications that have resulted from diabetes is exercising if they have any sort of eye involvement or eye damage because of high blood glucose levels then precaution should be taken that uh, no excessive or intense activity is done because if any intense or excessive activity that can increase blood pressure is done that can result in even more eye damage if patient has any orthopedic limitations then uh, make sure that proper warm up cool down is done before after the exercise as well as exercises to strengthen the muscles is done and no again sudden exercises should not be done to avoid any more damage to any joints or muscles guys it has to be low moderate intensity exercises for different cardiovascular diseases if patient has any um there should not be a uh, vigorous intensity exercise anyways and if patient has a myocardial infarction or uh, damage to the heart muscles then the exercises should be done really supervised in a supervised rehabilitation program and uh, always start from low to moderate intensity exercise even if the patient has had stroke start from low and then move up if patient has any nerve disease uh, like there is sensory nerve uh, involvement and patient cannot feel anything then patient will develop ulcers so daily inspection of the foot is advised to the patient and uh, care must be taken that you do not cause any more damage to the tissues where there is no sensation because patient will not be able to feel it and proper care of that area by daily inspections and uh, uh, you know having appropriate uh, lotion not keeping the skin dry and uh, making sure no fungal growth is there as well 
diet is an important part of the diabetes management and there are different ways how patient can control how much and what they are eating one is the diabetes plate method this is recommended by american diabetes association as well so they say that you should have uh, start from a plate that is maybe start from about a nine inch diameter plate and on one half of the plate have non-starchy vegetables vegetables that do not have a lot of carbs then have one fourth portion of the food that are carbohydrates more preferably the whole uh, whole foods so that they have complex carbohydrates rather than simple carbohydrates and then have uh, one fourth portion of protein and then along with that have a low calorie drink or preferably water so this method just allows you to not worry too much about counting each and every calorie in each and every food you could just divide your plate into these three sections and put the food accordingly here are some of the examples for um, non-starchy vegetables like cauliflower cabbage carrots okra green beans carbohydrate like whole grains uh, whole brown rice whole oats quinoa uh, whole grain pasta, fresh fruits, dried fruits, potatoes, pumpkin, milk, yogurt, and uh, some protein foods, uh, you know, for the precautions. Always, always consultation should be done uh, by the, uh, with the physician if you are uh, planning or if any diabetic patient is planning to do any sort of exercises. In this section, now we will be talking about the Parkinson's disease. This world map shows the prevalence of Parkinson's disease. So in 1990, there were about 2.5 million people with Parkinson's disease. In 2016, there are more than 6 million people with Parkinson's disease. And in this graph, you can see the uh, red orangish areas. They have more people. These countries have more people with Parkinson's disease. India, approximately in 2016, uh, there were about 500 um, 75,000 people living with Parkinson's disease. There is a structure in the brain. This one here, this is called as basal ganglia. This basal ganglia consists of different types of other structures in the brain. And these structures have nerve cells uh, that release dopamine. And those nerve cells are damaged and they do not have enough dopamine and that results in Parkinson's disease. This is how a typical patient of Parkinson's disease will present. They have a lot of stiffness. They have rigidity. They are stooped posture. They are flexed. Um, stooped posture. They are rigid. Their uh, elbows are flexed. Their hips are a little flexed. They can have uh, these resting tremors. While they're resting, their hands will be moving like this. These are called as the pill rolling resting tremors. And um, they are not very stable, so they can also have a fall. Here are some of the other symptoms how they can present with. So they will be slow. Their motor performance is going to be slow. They'll be slow in doing any task. Their writing is really small. Their face, they do not have any expressions. They are, it's like a mask face. They do not have expressions. They are very hesitant to start a movement and then they can also freeze while they are doing any movement. For example, while they are uh, walking, they'll freeze. They are slow at learning and if you tell them to, to, to do two different things at a time, like walk and count, they will, they will get slower. Their posture is really stooped forward. They have kyphosis and they have a risk of fall. Their thinking is also slowed and they can have some uh, impaired memory too. They can have pain. They, have, uh, they could also have loss of smell. Uh, and because of loss of smell, they have difficulty maintaining a healthy diet uh, because they do not feel like eating that much because they cannot smell the food. Um, they can also have difficulty swallowing. Their speech is also very slow and they speak in just one tone. Uh, they, are, they cannot differ their tone. This is one tone and slow speech. They can also have constipation. They can have increased oil secretion. Their chest expansion is also limited and their heart function could be reduced as well. While they are walking, if you look at them, their arm swing is reduced. They take small steps and they also have difficulty uh,
these are some of the treatment techniques that have been or uh, physical activities that have been utilized uh, in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Uh, patient picking in the chair that can also help provide them some relaxation, some range of motion exercises, doing some flexibility, stretching and for strengthening uh, some resistance exercises and also breathing exercises to help with their chest expansion. Because of all the different impairments that they have, they can have difficulty moving in the bed, uh, sitting in the bed, sitting to standing from the bed, and then standing and walking. So all of these areas, some physical activities could be done. Uh, therapists would usually teach them how to move in the bed, uh, side turning uh, to the left, to the right, and then from supine lying to sitting in the bed, then sitting to standing. And then when they stand, you can do some balance exercises. Uh, so like, you know, standing with two feet, then standing on one feet, uh, standing with a wide base of support, then narrowing the base of support or aerobic exercises could also be done. And here in this figure, you can see the therapist is trying to do the balance exercises and making the patient sit on this uh, thera ball. And here are some resistance exercises shown uh, for the patient because they have difficulty turning and doing rotations. So some exercises that help them rotate. As they have hard time with walking, uh, definitely walk training is very beneficial for these patients. You can make the patient first stand, then uh, standing with the help of support, then they stand without support, then they do their weight shift while standing, then they step forward just one step, then they step backward, then do they do side steps, then they finally move forward, then turning, and then you can increase their speed and duration of walking, and also while they're walking, then gradually you can tell them to do counting or do some other task. I would like to talk in brief about uh, some of the exercise programs that they follow here in the United States for Parkinson's patients. And uh, one of them is the LSVT uh, big. This LSVT big program, this is very intensive program. This is based on research and uh, what they say is that the movements get slowed in Parkinson's disease. They are smaller, they are less. The patient takes small steps, they do smaller movements. So they try to encourage the Parkinson's disease patients to bigger movements. So that's why they call it as LSVT big. So, but this is only done if you are certified uh, by them. And they have a very set protocol like four uh, consecutive days for four weeks there has to be 16 sessions and each session is like an hour long. There are a few principles on which their program is based on. They say that the program should be really intensive. They say that the exercises should be complex and there should be a lot of repetitions of exercises um, so as to cause any uh, changes in the brain. Also, they talk about the specificity that the exercises should be very specific to what kind of an improvement does the patient want. If patient wants to improve their gait, then the exercises should be uh, concentrated to, the, to their walking gait. And um, after uh, always, whenever there is a reward, uh, after you do the exercises or after they improve, it definitely helps with the brain changes as well. This is about one of the patients who had Parkinson's disease and uh, is 71 year old, uh, had difficulty walking, slowness, he had slow movements, he had, he has been falling, he used to like freeze uh, while doing any activity, especially walking. And uh, this patient was given this LSVT big program and in the next video we'll see the changes that uh, he had after the, after the LSVT big program. Here in this video is what you can see that patient uh, walking before and after the LSVT big, big program. So on this side here is the uh, before LSVT big program. You can see he's taking small steps and, uh, and here in this one you can see he's taking big steps, his arms are swinging and he can uh, move more faster.
program they do different sorts of things they have uh, exercises that patient needs to do every single day uh, like forward stepping side stepping backward stepping and then they also do the different functional movements like they'll do sit to stand they'll you could do rolling in the bed sit to stand whatever difficulty the patient has and um, then they, for some other activities whatever is their favorite like you know playing golf or they have difficulty getting in and out of the car and also these patients get uh, daily exercises uh, homework that they have to do it for all 30 days another program that is very popular in uh, united states and canada as well as in australia is the nordic walking or the urban polling so they have these poles um, and they take the help of these poles and then they walk. So it has been found that uh, if you do pole walking, there are many different muscles in your body that are active while you walk with the poles. So you are holding these poles and you're pushing the poles on the ground as well as you're walking forward so you're working your upper body as well as as well as the lower body so there are different benefits that they say uh, pole walking has it is a full body workout uh, there is an uh, increase in the strength of the core and the upper body muscles it increases the cardiorespiratory fitness it also improves your metabolic profile that means it helps with the triglyceride levels cholesterol levels the lipid profile in the blood gets better and also it increases the blood flow and this can be used in many of the conditions some of the conditions we have discussed so like diabetes also it has been shown to be helpful with obesity it has shown to be also helpful and uh, Parkinson's disease definitely we are discussing right here about it uh, but it also is beneficial for your heart health if you walk that when you do a full body workout and um, it has also been seen to be helpful with cancer uh, rehabilitation of cancer patients as well as for the patients who have um, ear and balance problems. So different studies have been done on pole walking or Nordic walking and Parkinson's disease. It On Parkinson's disease, it has been really searched well. So it has shown to improve the aerobic capacity, posture, cadence. A cadence is the number of steps per minute. Then quality of life in Parkinson's disease patients, it has shown to improve balance, mobility, coordination, gait, strength, and as well as other symptoms like it has shown to improve mood, depression, uh, cognition as well as help with fatigue you can see here on this slide how uh, walking with the poles helps with posture and arm swinging for parkinson's patients Another therapy that is gaining popularity here in the United States is the boxing therapy for the Parkinson's disease patients. So boxing, this is a form of high intensity exercises and involves pretty much all the regions of the body. And um, the type of boxing that is more popular here for Parkinson's disease is the rock steady boxing, but it should be performed by the trained coaches. Um, improvement have been seen with the strength, balance, as well as the walking, gait, the distance that could be walked, the velocity, quality of life, as well as hand-eye coordination. Here is the video that uh, shows some of the aspects of the boxing therapy and uh, you will see here in this video some of the patients doing the boxing therapy. When you put on those gloves, you feel big and strong. When you put on those gloves, you feel big and They're strong. Really dedicated. Parkinson's folks work their really tails off. The Parkinson's folks work their tails off. What we do is it's circuit style boxing training. What we do is it's and circuit style the idea, boxing the important training. thing is forced and intense the idea, exercise. The important thing is forced yeah. intense exercise. Yeah. Folks that end up in, uh, being most afflicted by it, 
have a hard I time actually moving it. By, uh, so I have, have a hard time actually have to try to do is kind of delay so that. One of the things you have to try to do is kind of The first signs I had were tremors. But I've first my movement so far has been pretty good. But I've so my movement so far has been pretty good. It seemed like an opportunity to come into a class like like an opportunity for an hour and a half of intensive exercise. For an hour and a half of intensive exercise. The idea is to have them get away from those small yeah, moves, so that's why boxing is such a big fit. When you have Parkinson's all of a sudden, your steps get smaller, when you have parts real small, you might not realize it as someone with Parkinson's that you your not feet that are shuffling Parkinson's along, but they are, that you and that's why boxing is so great, you have to, when you put on those gloves, you feel big and strong. When you put on those gloves, you feel big and strong. And it's not just physical exercise, it's mental exercise. And it's not just physical exercise, it's mental exercise. You have to talk loudly, you have to talk loudly, you have to remember sounds. You, you know, we do little drills that are, that are verbal kind of drills. Drill. Use, your, use your memory and, uh, and then you speak loudly. And some of the drills that would be loud might be just that somebody yells as loud as they can. So it is a pretty intense exercise and they usually do it in groups because uh, working in groups also provides them some encouragement. There are a lot of famous personalities who have had had Parkinson's disease and uh, one of the quotes said by Muhammad Ali who himself had Parkinson's is my favorite and that is the only limitation one has are the ones they place on themselves. So in nutshell there are different benefits of exercises. Exercises will help maintain health, manage stress, improve quality of life, help with type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease. It's going to lower down the risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. It is going to uh, help with uh, prevent any, uh, help with balance and prevent any falls, help with mental health, depression. Not only that, it's going to help with joint back pains and it is also beneficial for cancer patients. Uh, it also help improve sleep as well. So there are a lot of different benefits of uh, physical activity and exercises and just being active. Um, in older people who are otherwise healthy and do not have any other medical condition or do not have any special precautions, um, they are recommended by American College of Sports Medicine to do any uh, moderate intensity aerobic activity at least 150 minutes per week and uh, if they cannot start with 150 minutes per week they can just start with five minutes a day and uh, it should be supplemented two days in a week uh, by the muscle strengthening activities so uh, older adults who are otherwise healthy uh, this is the recommendation but all the uh, exercises physical activity that um, anybody does or older people do, they should uh, have a consultation with their physician. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to me and um, I'm, I'm glad I got a chance to speak with you all. Hello everyone. I'm so glad I got the opportunity to speak to you all. Hope you will find this presentation in helpful. Thank you so much. Have a good time listening. Uh, thank you, madam. You have enlightened us uh, how one's mental health, emotional, psychological and social well, well being and uh, cognitive functions are associated with regular physical activities. It is very clear physical inactivity is a major contributor. Uh. Good evening. Uh, special thanks to today's resource person, the instructor, Department of uh, Physical Therapy, University of St. Mary, USA, and Dr. Sonia Raval, Assistant Professor, Department of Physical Therapy, University of St. Mary, USA, for educating us with the new knowledge. On behalf of Mangalore University, 
and the Department of Physical Education, I extend heartfelt thanks to Dr. Phil Kilmer and uh, Dr. Sonia Rawal. We extend our heartfelt thanks to Mr. Raju Mogavira, KAS, Registrar of Mangalore University, Syndicate members of Mangalore University, Registrar Evaluation, Professor P. L. Dharma, and Finance Officer, Professor Narayan, for their valuable support and guidance. Of Kendriya Vidyalaya Sangathan, Bangalore, Mr. Ratish and Mr. B Mr. Bin uh, Miss Bindu, Sports Officers of K and uh, Mr. Pratap, Research Scholar, for their all hearted support for the success of this webinar. I extend sincere thanks to my colleagues in the department, Mr. Shaban, technical person, Mr. Ramesh Chen, joint organizing secretary of this webinar for their all hearted support for the success of this webinar. Dr. Kishore Kumar CK, director of physical education and the organizing secretary of this webinar under his direction the international webinar has been organized with a grand success. Thank you very much, sir. Definitely, we remember the work done by the different persons in a large way being responsible for this success of this webinar. I extend heartfelt thanks to all of them. I extend my special thanks to all the participants of this webinar and who have supported directly, indirectly, to conduct this webinar with a grand success. Thank you, one and all. Over to Director of Physical Education. Thank you, Dr. Harita Skolor. I also personally thank uh, uh, Professor Anand Shetty, Head of Physical Therapy, USCA, and uh, Professor Bindu, Head Department of uh, Biotechnology, uh, Ramaya Institute, uh, Bangalore, and uh, Mr. Pratap, Physical Education uh, Director, and uh, Ms. Uh, Rupati, Physical Education Director of uh, Besant College, Bangalore, for their wholehearted support for the smooth conduct of uh, this uh, international webinar. Once again, I take each and international.